introduce the speaker. Uh, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Ron Butler, uh, who is an animal ecologist and professor emeritus at the University of Maine at Farmington, where he taught courses in zoology, entomology, ecology, and conservation biology. While Ron spent the first part of his career conducting research with seabirds in Maine, Newfoundland, and Antarctica, for the past several decades, his work has focused on ecologically important groups of insects. Ron helped to plan and coordinate several statewide citizen science initiatives, including the Maine Damselfly and Dragonfly Survey, the Maine Butterfly Survey, and the Maine Bumblebee Atlas. Ron co-authored the recently published in September, Butterflies of Maine and the Canadian Maritime Provinces, and he's presently working on Damselflies and Dragonflies of Maine and the Canadian Maritime Provinces. Welcome, Ron, and thanks so much for joining us this evening. It's my pleasure to come back to Kelt again. So again, in the spirit of full disclosure, I am not an entomologist. I am an animal ecologist. I started my graduate work working on rodents. I did some postdoctoral work on the Canadian beaver. And then I spent the first couple of decades of my life working on seabirds in, um, as Emily said, uh, Maine, Newfoundland, and a couple of research trips to the Antarctic. And it was uh, toward the end of my work with seabirds uh, in Maine that I decided that I really wanted to switch to a group of organisms that I was also interested in that I thought would allow me to be more impactful in um, conservation initiatives in the region. And so for the past several decades, I have helped um, design, implement, and uh, coordinate uh, along with colleagues of uh, those three um, citizen science or community science initiatives that Emily mentioned, starting with damselflies and dragonflies, my first love, and then butterflies, and then more recently, bumblebees. And we're just starting to now talk about uh, what the next citizen science initiative will look like. Um, tonight, I want to talk about um, butterflies in particular. Um, from the time we first planned the butterfly survey until we entered the last data into the book weeks before it went to the publisher, um, it was about 17 years uh, in the making of this particular book. So I'm going to kind of give you a synopsis of, of things that you can find in the book. Uh, but I want to talk, as I do about all of these critters, about kind of the cultural, you know, manifestation of, of this particular group of insects uh, in uh, world culture, not just North American culture. And so if you examine the mention of butterflies in myth, uh, in literature, uh, um, in folk tales, um, in various cultures, I tend to find this list of references, of descriptions, and they really break down into four key areas. Butterflies are often represented as soul, spirit, spiritual guide type entities in some cultures. In others, they take on the guise of departed ancestors or departed loved ones. In others, they have a magical quality associated with witches or good omens, and in some cases, bad omens. And in a number of cultures, probably linked to the life cycle, there's this um, concept of transformation or rebirth. And again, if you think about the butterfly life cycle, that makes sense. This is a 2000 plus year old Pompeian mosaic that basically um, represents death, the skull, as the great leveler between the, and hopefully you can see my cursor, between the poor and the rich. And note the symbol used under the skull for the soul is a butterfly. In contemporary culture, and you can just take North America here in most cases, uh, you can find butterfly references to almost anything. There's butterfly jewelry, there's butterfly collections, there's butterfly art. Uh, this upper right is an African uh, sculpture composed entirely of butterfly wings. There are butterfly aircraft and butterfly 
boats and weapons and wines and beers, uh, clothing, uh, the pubs, cafes, uh, yard art, body art. Uh, so it's, it's an iconic critter, much the way I would say dragonflies are an iconic insect. Butterflies, as opposed to dragonflies, have the added uh, option uh, in many countries of uh, being showcased in uh, butterfly houses or butterfly uh, uh, observation uh, foyers. Um, the really good ones have both outdoor exhibits for native butterflies as well as indoor exhibits. And I will say there's there's really nothing quite like on a dreary January day going into a butterfly house with all sorts of you know insects in the air landing on you, landing on the people, and so forth. Um, there are something on the vicinity of thirteen hundred uh, established insects that are consumed as food worldwide. Um, caterpillars are a sizable segment of that um, um, insect, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, buffet. Um, and some of these will be moths, but some of them will be butterflies as well. That particular dish is the uh, tequila giant skipper, and here's shown in some adult form. Most of them are consumed as larvae, not as, as, as adults. So, Within this order of insects, the Lepidoptera, we're dealing with the moths and the butterflies. And that large order is broken down into four suborders. The largest of those, the Glossata. That's the, the suborder uh, that contains, again, both moths and butterflies that have a coiled proboscis, okay? So it's really coiled. It, we call it a proboscis. It's not really a nose or a snout. It's really made of, of evolutionarily of, the, of uh, some of the mouth parts of the kind of primal insect. Uh, here you can see a peck skipper with the fully uncoiled proboscis. And here in flight, just uncoiling, probably about to land a, a snowberry clear one. If you see it the way the animal normally holds it, um, in flight in particular, if it's not approaching a flower, it's usually pretty tightly coiled. Now, that's an electron micrograph. It's not an actual live shot, but you can see how coiled that structure is. So within this um, suborder, there are three more suborders. They're very tiny by contrast. We have about 165,000 plus species. I say plus because um, like dragonflies, it seems like a new species discovered every month. Um, to most people's surprise, 90 plus percent of that group are moths. So butterflies are a really small percentage of all Lepidoptera. Within that single suborder, then, we have 40 superfamilies, the Papillonidae. It's the super family that includes the butterflies and skippers. The skippers used to be their own super family, but uh, recent genomics and taxonomy studies suggest no, they're actual butterflies and they belong to the same uh, uh, super family. So within the Peplinoidea, we have seven families of butterflies. Five of these are found in our region. So much of what we know about butterfly taxonomy and evolution now is due to the science of genomics, DNA sequencing, looking at DNA fragments from lots and lots of species of butterflies to look for similarities and differences and using um, those same sequencing techniques to actually date divergences between groups or species in particular. And so that a lot of this work has been done relatively recently. And what we understand of, of Lepidopteran evolution is based largely on that because insects generally have a poor fossil record. Unlike vertebrates with bones and teeth 
that fossilize really well. Insects generally don't fossilize very well. And so while we do have some excellent fossils of insects, and there's one here, uh, an extinct species, Prodryas, uh, from 35 million years ago, uh, Mega Anims, it's a abbreviation for million years. Um, again, much of what you see here is based on genomics. The oldest moths seem to date back to about 300 million years ago. And the first butterflies put in appearance about 200 million years later. So moths were largely uh, night flying at the time that butterflies diverged from the main line of moth evolution. And for a long time, the consensus seemed to be that bats were the driver of that uh, uh, departure from the kind of nocturnal um, lifestyle. But the, the bat uh, fossil records suggest that bats really didn't radiate for another 30 million years after butterflies first appeared. So they can't have been the primary selection driver in that sense. The present consensus suggests that bees may have indirectly driven the evolution of butterflies. Bees, which are wasps, uh, diverged from wasp, the mainline wasp evolution to form their uh, kind of vegetarian uh, group uh, about 130 million years ago. And with the divergence of bees from wasps, um, we see kind of a concomitant co-evolution of, uh, evolu of, of evolutionary diversity in flowers. And kind of the co-evolved relationship with bees and flowers driving radiations of species in both groups may have opened that evolutionary door for a successful day flying group of moths, which we now know are butterflies. In terms of their distribution and diversity on the planet, um, all continents except Antarctica. Um, the genomics research suggests that butterflies actually originated in the Americas, not the tropics, despite the fact that their diversity is much greater in the tropics and subtropics than it is in uh, temperate and boreal regions. So if you look at these red areas, we're dealing with, in some cases, 4,000 species in one place. Whereas uh, if we go north all the way to Greenland, we find a great number of species, six, so not. Um, and smaller numbers of species as you move to the pole, toward the poles. So I said earlier, 165 plus thousand uh, moths and butterflies. Uh, 815 species known north of Mexico. Once you go south of the Mexican border, the number of species increases dramatically. 575 species um, regularly occur in the lower 48. We do get vagrants or strays, uh, but the regularly occurring species, about 575. Fewer in Canada, about 275. So again, as you move from the equator, this is true of many species groups, uh, species diversity drops. We're pretty much probably from grade school on all familiar with the life cycle of uh, the butterfly. Like about 88 plus percent of all insects, they are holometabolic. That has, they have true metamorphosis with four distinct life stages, the egg, the larval or caterpillar stage, the pupa, chrysalis cocoon stage, and finally the adult stage. Generation times uh, for butterflies are often pretty short. Um, often they can go from the egg to adult in, depending upon the species, one to a couple of months. So the life stages, each of those life stages tend to be short. 
the exception is for any stage that overwinters, obviously. Uh, in those cases, we're talking about a stage that lasts the entire winter. And in some cases, it may be the same stage that was very short when it occurred during the summer. In those species that are multi-bolting, boltinism refers to the number of times that a species breeds during the season. So a unibolting species breed once during the breeding season, bivolting twice, multi-bolting multiple times. Obviously, if you're going to have multiple generations in the same season, though those life stages can be even shorter in some species. In terms of feeding, um, we have, a, again, a kind of a life cycle divergence. Larvae tend to be specialists. Now, contrary to popular belief, the larva of a butterfly species doesn't necessarily feed on only one plant species, but they do often feed on only one plant family. And even generalists who feed on more than one plant family tend to feed on closely related plant families. Adults, on the other hand, are pretty much generalists. They will feed on, for those that feed on nectar, which is most of them, almost any nectar source will do. Some are preferred, but you can find them feeding on a vast variety of different kinds of, of flower uh, species. There are, which seems unlikely given that kind of straw-like uh, mouth part that butterflies have, a few species that actually are able to feed on pollen. There are some species, especially some of our early species, um, uh, like commas, that will feed on sap. There are species that will feed on rotting fruit. Um, some species will actually feed on animal carcasses, although usually they're, uh, after liquefying, um, um, degrading, of uh, organic content. And you can frequently find, I can't get my, uh, there it is. I just don't get it. Butterflies feeding on feces, or if your dog urinates in the same spot every um, day, you may find uh, butterflies feeding there. Mostly they're, they're um, after salts that have been deposited. You can also find them around uh, kind of perennial mud puddles that form, for instance, in dirt roads that dry frequently. Uh, every time the water evaporates in these puddles, it leaves salts behind, so some trace salts that butterflies are able to extract. We find a variety of overwintering strategies in butterflies. Some butterflies overwinter as eggs. Some as pupa some as larvae, some as adults, and some leave the area and migrate. And of course, we're all familiar with the migration of monarchs, although I always have to impress on people um, who aren't very familiar with, with butterflies, is the monarchs that leave in the fall are not the monarchs that come back in the spring. In other words, this is a generational migration. Usually what comes back to us in May in the spring is the great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren, if you want to think about it that way, of the uh, monarchs that left in the fall. So this is a multi-generational kind of migration. The multiple generations usually on the way back, not on the way down. And that migration, by the way, is, is, is pretty spectacular. Um, but it's actually not the longest migration we find amongst butterflies. Uh, the painted lady in Europe does an even more spectacular migration from northern Europe to equatorial Africa and back again. So that's that's a that's a real long distance migration. I don't know if you've spotted it in the list, um, but we we tend to think of okay. Um, Overwintering strategy is kind of a life history evolutionary characteristic and probably a family of butterflies all do the same thing. But in fact, it's not the case. And I'll just show you one example. All of those butterflies are in the same family. And you see three 
different overwintering strategies depending upon the species. But I think that just speaks to the length of time these families have been around in terms of evolution. Um, and the fact that when you have a very old group of organisms, selective forces can drive evolutionary adaptations uh, in diverging ways from kind of the ancestral condition. In terms of the ecological significance of butterflies in terrestrial food webs, they can both as larvae and adults uh, serve as decomposers. We saw all those butterflies on top of that, that uh, whatever kind of feces that was, right? Many of the larvae of butterflies are um, herbivores. There are some carnivorous uh, larvae. Uh, in all stages of their life cycles, uh, butterflies are prey to a variety of different organisms from insects to vertebrates. In all stages of their life cycles, they are hosts to a variety of parasites and parasitoids, the latter being those uh, usually insects that have a parasitic uh, larval form and a free-living adult form. We know that most, not all, but most adult butterflies are nectivores. So they're important in that regard too, um, in terms of flow of energy in terrestrial food webs. Butterflies, of course, are well-known pollinators. That's an important group there. And um, from a purely anthropocentric perspective, um, some species of butterflies are excellent ecological uh, indicators of uh, perturbations of the habitat. And that can be anything from habitat fragmentation to environmental contamination or as we're seeing basically worldwide today, global climate change. So we often get asked the, the easy way to distinguish butterflies from moths. You know, when I first started working with butterflies, I have to admit there was more than one occasion where I thought I'd found a new species, some really flashy, colorful thing I did not recognize. And I'm flying and I netted it and it turned out to be a moth. Yeah, so we do have day flying moths, and um, it there, there aren't really any um, really good, clear, distinct ways to tell them apart, uh, except really maybe one that really works well. So what I often have people say, well, you know, moths are nocturnal, butterflies are diurnal. Yeah, well, except not. There are lots of examples of day flying moths, and there's one family of butterflies that's nocturnal. Uh, I've heard the rule, well, butterflies rest with their wings open while moths tend to fold theirs, right? Well, somebody didn't tell that Baltimore checker spot the rule is. You can see his wings are clearly folded while um, many butterflies will open, including this butterfly, which I showed you on the cover slide, they often close them because as you'll see in a, in a couple of slides, often at times, uh, the underside of the wings is cryptically colored. And so it's adapted for the animal to fold its wings. Um, I often hear moths are fuzzy, butterflies are not. When well, I show you some pretty fuzzy butterflies, this moth is pretty fuzzy and it's a crovia, right? This moth is doesn't look very fuzzy by contrast. Moths are more erratic in flight. Um, yeah, that's true, really. But it's hard to, unless you've got a really good eye for it, unless you can see a butterfly and a moth flying at the same time, it's hard to pick that out. So what we find is in moths that have this little structure called a frenulum, which prevents the moth from flapping its wings independently in the kind of more graceful way that butterflies are able to pull that trick off. The easiest way to discriminate the two, um, 
that I always tell people is to look at the antennae. Moths can have a variety of antennae. They can be plumos, they can be really thin and filiform. Um, they tend not to have anything that approaches a real club. Now this one gets gradually thicker, but it doesn't form a distinct club on the end, as you can see in this northern crescent, which I'll blow up. So you can see that's a real clear club. Okay, so that, that one works pretty well across lots of butterflies, except for that odd night flying group, but we're not likely to see that one anyway. Um, almost always the wing patterns of butterflies um, on the undersurface is different from the top surface, dorsal versus ventral. So in each case, this is the same species of butterfly. And now you can see what I'm talking about in terms of crypticity, that underwing is really important there. The color that we see in butterfly wings, of course, is due to these chitinous scales. That patterning, uh, you can see if you look really closely, you can actually see the individual scales here. And if you blow those up, then it becomes really clear what we're looking at. And I should say that the color, again, is a combination of both pigments in the scales, as well as the way light refracts through the scales. So it's a combination of those two things. The reason butterflies are popular with naturalists is because many of them have very distinctive um, wing markings, which allow many species to be identified uh, pretty readily if you have a good field guide. And there are some descriptors of the various bands and spots and patterns uh, that you can see on the upper wing and forewing. This is a plate made out of a book uh, for anybody who wants to orient themselves with it. The book itself was based on and not one survey, but two surveys. We started the main butterfly survey uh, in 2006. Uh, our colleagues in Canada decided to start a very similar survey and talk to them about what we were doing and they kind of modeled what they were doing based on what we were doing in terms of the main butterfly atlas in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. And when it came time to put all this together, we decided to simply to merge the two efforts into one regional um, guide because I'm pretty sure the butterflies do not recognize that dotted line. You can see the uh, accumulation of butterfly records in both the Maritimes and Maine going back into the 1800s. And you can see what happened when we started the two surveys, an exponential increase in the number of records accumulated by citizen scientists. And that is the sole value of citizen science in any state, much less a rural state like Maine with a small population and a small number of professionals. There's no way that we have the person power to conduct the kind of survey that this butterfly survey accomplished. So it's it's really a, a, a credit to all those volunteers who spent so much of their time in the field um, surveying butterflies that we have this tremendous increase in our knowledge of the butterfly fauna of the region. This is a table out of the book and I'm gonna summarize it real quickly for you. Um, in Maine, we added um, eight new species to the species list as a result of the survey, and one species to the U.S. list that had never been reported in the United States before. Um, you'll note this species here is not in that red uh, rectangle. Uh, that's the uh, white M hair streak, and that was actually discovered after the survey was over. In the Maritimes, uh, 13 new provincial records and four new species for the Maritimes. No new national records, but still a, a, a pretty 
an amazing accomplishment. For those of you unfamiliar with it, this is a heat map. So the hotter an area is in this case, the more species, the cooler, the fewer species. And if you look, you can see that uh, in the Maritimes, you have these hot regions here. Um, I'm going to suggest these hot regions are sort of biased by sampling effort to some extent. Um, if we look at Maine, we can see we have this big cold area here. If you've been to this big cold area here, you know there aren't a whole lot of roads back there, and it's a long ways from anyway. That said, there's no question about we having this real high concentration of species in the southern extreme of the state. And we think that concentration is related to uh, eco-regional differences or biogeophysical regions or biophysical regions, however you want to think about that. So if you're not familiar with that concept, there's a bunch of schemes um, out there to describe the ecological regions of the world, really, but of North America in particular. This one is the one the EPA uses um, to describe their, their um, eco-regional um, uh, schema. And they break it down into level one to increasingly finer divisions based on the ecological characteristics of the region, um, its geographical features, and its plant species assemblages. So in this particular region three, and I'm going to blow that up for you, what you see is much of the region falls in this or this ecoregion. But there's this tongue that's actually related to a much larger southern coastal ecoregion that's different from these. And I think that in part explains the hot spot that we see in the heat map with a real concentration in southern Maine. So in the region, 123 regional species. In Maine, 121 species, 95 of which are residents, seven of which are colonists. And you'll note 95 and seven does not add up to 121. And that's because we have a number of species that are what we call strays. They may appear, they may not appear. They don't seem to breed here. They just, you know, they're here one year, they're, they're not the next. Um, so we have no evidence that they're actually colonizing the area. Same pattern in Canada, uh, 93 species, uh, 76 of which are residents, and six are colonists and some strings. Well, I can't go through all 123 species in the time I have remaining, but I will give you a sampling of what we have. And I've taken all of these pictures from the book. We tried to get stellar photographers to contribute their material, and they were very gracious in doing so. And so I'll start out with the family that includes the skippers, 34 species. Um, this is a pair of least skippers mating. Within this family, we have a number of subfamilies. The dicot skippers include four species. This is the northern cloudy wing. This is probably our largest skipper. This is the aptly named silver spotted skipper. Pretty hard one to miss. About the size of a half dollar when you see it. Much larger than most skippers you'll see. We have the subfamily of spread wing skippers, of which there are five species. This is the wild indigo dusky wing. This is the common sooty wing. Now, the common sooty wing is a stray. We don't have any evidence that it breeds in Maine. It's not always here, but we do have a number of records for the species. Um, this particular subfamily only has one species. Um, it's the Arctic skipper, one of my favorites. It's a really uh, bold, um, oh, sorry, I should have done that. A really boldly colored skipper on the dorsal surface. And, oops, sorry, I don't know why I was not doing that. There it is. 
And for those of you who know fritillaries, we describe it as a fritillary wannabe. For those of you who don't, I'll show you why that's the case. So his underwing has these big silvery spots. Now, lots of skippers do have white spots on the underwing. In the grass skippers, we have this one, the common branded skipper, also known as the Laurentian skipper. I find the skipper more in the mountains than I do out towards the coast, more like midsummer, late summer. The common roadside skipper, so called because you can commonly see it on the side of dirt roads about 12 inches off the ground doing these uh, courtship displays. It's a very dark skipper. Another very common skipper in Maine, the Hobomock skipper, very distinctive underwing pattern. Less vibrant, the Dunn skipper. I consider this sort of a you know, mid to late summer species, very common, this dun colored brown. And when the animals get older, the, the heads get quite yellowy, uh, more yellow than you see in this particular specimen. The cobweb skipper, this is a species of special concern and I'll come back to that. This is a state listed species. Um, another transient, another stray, the long tailed skipper, never reported in Maine before 2012. Now we have four or five records of it in the state. Pretty hard to miss when you see this one. The European skipper, the most common skipper in Maine and the Maritimes. Um, as the name implies, this is not a North American species. This was introduced uh, in Ontario sometime around 1900, 1910 or so. The largest butterflies in the state belong to the smallest family, and these are the swallowtails of which we have seven species. The one that is yellow that most of you have seen is the one shown here. This is the Canada tiger swallowtail. The very similar looking but much rarer Eastern tiger swallowtail. Uh, the most records with one or two exceptions for this species are from extreme Southern Maine. And we're not even sure it breeds in Maine. It may just be one of those species that, that uh, moves in every summer. We have some black swallowtails. And this one is the black swallowtail, as it turns out. Um, it's uh, fairly common. In contrast, the spicebush swallowtail is not. It is a species of special concern. The largest butterfly we have in Maine is this one. This is the Eastern Giant Swallowtail. It was recorded in Maine in 1886 and not seen again, or at least not recorded again, until 2011. We now have a number of records and we have evidence of it breeding in central Maine. Our next family are the whites and sulfurs. Um, this is a, uh, our two um, uh, mustard whites uh, in their summer form. And I say that because their spring form looks very different. So let me just go back and see here that you see maybe a little trace of that pigment along the underside of the, the veins of the wing but here it's quite dramatic by contrast. Our most common white, of course, is this one. This is the cabbage white. Uh, this uh, butterfly is native to Africa and Eurasia. Um, it's mostly worldwide now. It appeared in North America sometime in the late 1800s. And if you pick um, worms out of your cabbage or your broccoli, it's almost assuredly the larvae of this guy. 
We have six species of sulfurs in Maine, three of them far more common than the other three. This particular one is the pink edge sulfur, and it is, as of last year, officially our state butterfly. It is not the only butterfly with pink edges, unfortunately. This one has pink edges. In fact, its edges may be even more pink, as does this one. So if I go back here, I'll call your attention to this spot on the underside of the wing. Very clear, right? Notice this one has a satellite spot. So there are actually two spots. So that's an easy way to, to tell them apart if you see the two. The amount of pink is not going to be helpful to you. This particular butterfly, the orange sulfur, um, generally has a trace of orange on the underside of its wing. Notice it also has a satellite spot, but it's really the dorsal surface of the wings that more uh, likely give the butterfly its name. It usually has really conspicuous orange coloration. The Lycanidae, or Lycanidae, I've heard the adopters pronounce it both ways, uh, are the gossamer wings, a group of really relatively small, beautiful butterflies. Um, 33 species um, in this group. Oh, sorry. In the subfamily that includes the harvesters, again, we're dealing in our region with a single species. Um, this is the harvester, um, and it is the one of the uh, butterflies that's larva is not an herbivore. Its larva is a predator of aphids. The coppers include uh, six species. The one that most of us see is this one. It's the American copper, beautiful little butterfly, both the the upper wing and the and the uh, lower wing are are really beautifully colored. We also have uh, the bog copper, another common species, as the name implies, more likely around bogs. And um, Clayton's copper. Clayton's copper is on Maine's threatened list. Again, I'm going to talk about those designations in a bit. The next subfamily we have in this group are the hair streaks and elephants, of which there are 17 species. Again, beautiful little butterflies. We're ta still talking about lycanids, right? So this is the coral hair streak. You can see why it's called that. Beautiful coral pattern. Edward's ha hair streak is unfortunately endangered in the state. Hessel's hair streak also beautiful, also endangered in the state. My favorite, the juniper hair streak. I've seen this guy once at a distance, um, also on Maine's endangered list. We have seven elephants, again, same subfamily. The most common one that people report is this one. This is the Eastern Pine elephant. The brown elephant, which looks similar, but you can see there is quite a difference in the underwing pattern there. And finally, a species of special concern, the hoary elephant. The subfamily that includes the blues, and here you see a western tail blue, and I chose this photo because it shows the upper wing, which is what gives the family its name, or subfamily, excuse me. And you can see the tails here. This is the northern blue. And again, if you could see its upper wing, you would see that, that it's, it's quite blue by contrast. But that's a beautiful underwing pattern as well. Most of these butterflies, by the way, are identified by their underwing, not their overwing patterns. The silvery blue. Again, a very distinctive underwing pattern. 
confusing group um, called the Azures. This group, I'm um, confident the taxonomy is still not fully settled. Uh, if there's any group of organisms in which taxonomy tends to be more fluid than insects, I don't know what it is. Um, uh, this particular species is the northern azure, and it comes in three distinct forms uh, over the course of the season. We have another species of azure and possibly two more um, unrecognized species of azures in the state. The last family of butterflies is the largest. These are the um, nymphalids, okay, the uh, brushfoots. So these include the, uh, uh, amongst other things, this pair of uh, mating Baltimore checker spots. Um, we have a subfamily called the snouts, one species in the state. This is the American snout. Its uh, labial palps are highly modified evolutionary, evolutionarily to resemble kind of a twig or a stem, maybe a petiole, to give the appearance of a leaf, a dead leaf, when the animal has its wings folded. Very distinctive butterfly. You won't see anything else like this in the state. The subfamily uh, that includes the milkweed butterflies. We have one species in the state. That's the monarch, everybody's favorite. We have the subfamily uh, that includes uh, the fritillaries and longwings, of which we have 10 species. This particular one is an Aphrodite um, fritillary. And for those of you unfamiliar with fritillaries, I will bring back our wannabe skipper. Uh, so I make my point. You can see that the spots here are very reminiscent of the silvery spots that we see on fritillaries. And so again, a different fritillary, the bog fritillary that graces the cover of the book. And our largest frit, the great spangled fritillary. Subfamily that includes the admirals and the sisters. We have a couple of species of these in the state. The white admiral, which was the emblem of the Maine butterfly survey, beautiful butterfly. Um, it's other more, the red spotted purple, also is frequently seen in the state. And the viceroy belongs to the subfamily. And for those folks who have trouble distinguishing uh, monarchs from viceroys, there's a whole bunch of ways to do that. Um, first, they're not the same size, but if you don't see them side by side, note this distinctive band in the hind wing of the viceroy that you don't have in the monarch. Easy to see from a distance. The subfamily that includes the through brushfoots, of which we have 18 species. Lots of var uh, variation in the species. This particular one of my favorite with the kind of cat size in the wing here is Milbert's tortoiseshell, one of our overwintering species, as is uh, the morning cloak. And for those of you who don't follow main insects, or um, we've already had um, a number of morning cloak sightings during the unusually warm spring we had. Some of these gay guys came out of hibernation. The common buckeye. The common buckeye is not a resident, it's a, but it is a frequent colonist. So it comes here, establishes colonies, but then may disappear for a couple of years before we see it again. The American lady. Uh, very similar to the painted lady. The distinction in the American lady too large colored eye spots on the ventral surface of the hind wing. Four colored but smaller eye spots on the ventral surface of the hind wing. The red admiral, not the same genus as the white admiral. Our northern pearl crescent, 
um, commonly confused in southern Maine with the actual pearl crescent. Very hard to distinguish these guys sometimes. One of uh, three checker spots we have in the state, I showed you the Baltimore checker spot in a couple of slides. This is Harris checker spot. Our angle wings, so-called because of these highly sculpted angles in the wings. So these guys are very cryptic, kind of leaf-like, dead leaf-like when they have their wings folded. Notice the question mark really clearly displayed there. One of our commas, you can see the comma here, not a question mark. And this particular one is the green comma. Another question mark, this one, the hoary comma, this is a species of concern in the state. Some of our other woodland butterflies belong to the subfamily of satyrs, of which we have nine species. This is the little wood satyr. This is kind of the similar looking northern pearly eye. You can see the, the prevalence of eye spots on the underside of the wing. This is the common wood nymph. This occurs in a couple of forms in Maine. In one form, we have this big light patch around these two spots. In another form, this patch is hardly visible. It just looks like two spots. And the common ringlet. This is the most common butterfly in uh, not only Maine, but northeastern North America. Again, not native to North America. This butterfly was introduced in Ontario in the early 1900s. And our rarest butterfly, if we consider rarity in terms of geographic distribution, this is the Katahdin Arctic. And the only place that the Katahdin Arctic exists is in the tablelands on Mount Katahdin. That's a pretty limited geographic distribution. If I look at the state listed species in terms of their distribution, it tends to follow the same pattern as the heat map. We can follow, we can find some of these kind of spread around the northern region, but there's a real concentration down here in the area of highest butterfly diversity in the region. So that's probably no big surprise, but there's probably another reason for that too. I'll get into that. If you're unfamiliar with the state listing, um, scheme, it goes in uh, order of increasing uh, importance, species of uh, greatest conservation need, species of special concern, threatened species, and endangered species. And you can see the numbers of main butterflies in each case in those categories. I remind you that um, a species that's listed in the state may not be listed in other states where it's much more common or may not be listed in other states because they don't want to list it or they don't list insects. Um, and that federal uh, listings always supersede state listings. In terms of threats to butterflies, there are a number that we can come up with in the region. Some probably don't pertain to Maine, like we don't have a lot of peat mining going on here. Uh, as can be found in some places in the Maritimes. And you can see that four of these really dominate the, the uh, number of species that are impacted. And those include development, pesticides, natural ecological succession, as open ground goes to forest, that rules out a lot of non-forest butterflies, and of course, climate change. And I'm just going to dwell, dwell on climate change because we've had so many reminders of that this year in this country and in this state. So the fact that we have a longer growing season is simply a fact. Okay, we can't deny it. You can't say it's made up. It's not a hoax. Spring comes about two to two weeks earlier 
Uh, fall lasts about two weeks later, and the growing season in the country is two to three weeks longer. And that affects all sorts of critters, including butterflies. So what we're seeing in butterflies are earlier flight periods, and this is from the literature now. Later flight periods, they're appearing earlier, uh, they're appearing later. A temporal mismatch. So because larvae tend to be plant family hosts, there has to be a tight synchrony between when adults breed and when young plants are germinating, because once plants become mature, they start secreting um, metabolites in their tissues that make them either unpalatable to butterflies or interrupt their their life cycle in some way. So it's really it's really those you know, young plants that are more optimal in terms of breeding habitat. If the plants and the butterflies get out of sync, the butterflies don't breed. That's temporal mismatch. We've seen examples of that in this country. Shifts in geographic range. Uh, butterflies are moving their range. I'll give you some examples. Changes in body size, both larger and smaller, depending upon the species and the geographic region. Changes in behavior in terms of breeding, uh, mating, and so forth. Changes in volcanism. Some species that were univoltine, bred once a year, are now becoming bivoltine. And changes in butterfly communities uh, due to the introduction of new species. And I'm not just talking about new butterfly species, which can change the kind of competitive milieu for butterflies, but also new predators, new parasites, new pathogens, new parasitoids. From the survey data, we did an analysis of 10 butterfly species that we had lots of records for. And we were just looking for, in the two regions, Maine and the Maritimes, whether they were seen earlier in the season and whether they were seen later in the season. And we, we applied a statistical analysis to that. And sure enough, we found in uh, Maine three species that were now uh, appearing significantly earlier than they had been previously, and that is before 2000. And uh, more species than that doing it in the Maritimes. We also found species being recorded much later in the season than they had been historically in both Maine and the Maritimes. Probably more importantly, we found some species that were doing both. That means their flight period is now much longer than it used to be. And again, in terms of reproduction and what the plants are doing that the butterflies depend on, that's an open question. So we are seeing those effects right here in the region. A more compelling argument from most people's perspective is new species. So this is the black dash. The black dash was unknown in Maine prior to 1996. Um, after the year 2000, it started breeding regularly and now is a constant resident in a number of southern Maine townships. It's here. This butterfly, same situation, okay? In the mulberry wing, we did not find any of these guys prior to 2000. And after that, we started seeing it regularly and it is now breeding regularly in a number of main townships in, in the southern extreme of the state. So we do have range changes occurring in Maine now. We tried to look forward um, in the book to what other species we might expect. And so what we did is we looked at the ranges of a number of species uh, south of us and the habitats that they required. And we selected 20 that we thought were high probability species. And in the chapter in the book, we lay that we lay those species out, the ones we, we predict will come. Now, if you don't 
when you publish a book, you, you know, we sent the book to the, uh, the publisher and, you know, the final draft to the publisher in the spring of, you know, 2022. And it came out in the fall, like in September of 2023. In the month before the book hit the book market, this butterfly was spotted in Southern Maine in August of 2023 one of the 20 we predicted horses dusky wing now is it breeding here no but it's never been seen in maine before until last year and a second one in the top 20 the zabulon skipper also appeared in the same month in kittery uh, spotted by our own herb wilson so two of the 20 that weren't here that we predicted would be have now made an appearance How are butterflies doing in North America? Well, as it turns out, the analyses that have been done based on uh, North American Butterfly Association counts and so forth show that the, the trends vary in terms of populations. So one analysis found that 48% of the butterfly species they examined were decreasing by about 1% per year. But there are, are generally ecological losers and winners when you have these kinds of big changes, in this case introduced probably by climate. So 26% of those species examined were actually increasing by 1% per year. Hotspots, shown here again with a different kind of heat map, were major declines in populations in the Southwest with some increases in the Pacific Northwest and the Southeast. And that also included kind of Southern Alaska. I always get asked about monarchs. I'll just throw that in right now. Monarchs precipitous decline in terms of the areas in Mexico that they're wintering. Right now, in the literature in the last five years, you can find contradictory accounts of the true status of monarchs. There's at least one study out there suggesting that based on these summer counts, monarchs may be gearing up their reproduction to um, kind of balance what's being lost um, in Mexico due to uh, habitat fragmentation and what was lost in the American croplands due to the production of glyphosate resistant uh, corn and soybeans, allowing the wholesale use of glyphosates and uh, the eradication of milkweed in many agricultural landscapes. However, there is another study showing that the analysis that study did is flawed. And in fact, if you um, account for the fact that they didn't take into to, uh, account data collected from agricultural uh, landscapes that, in fact, monarchs are doing badly um, almost everywhere, except in the West and the Southeast and Florida, where they may now be establishing overwintering populations. So I, I, I'm sort of at a loss here in terms of coming down on definitively in terms of the monarch question. What is clear from the data that's been uh, collected and shown in these two graphs is the drivers tend to be temperature and precipitation. Butterfly populations don't do well as temperatures increase or precipitation decreases, both of which in many regions are going to be associated with global climate change. And so that brings us around to this New York Times 2018 article, The Insect Apocalypse. Is it here? Um, I don't know. Would I be surprised if it was? Not at all. The decline in a number of insect groups has been very well documented and verified, especially some pollinating groups especially bees, for example. 
Is that the global pattern for insects? That's unclear. There are at least some studies out there showing increases in the populations of some kinds of insects. And it's a complex issue because we don't think about, well, let me, let me restate that. We tend to think about insects the way we think about rabbits or deer or something. And, and, and we shouldn't. Insects breed very rapidly. They have very, very short generation times, okay? So it's a complex issue in part because historical data is often poor. We don't have the same kinds of survey efforts to match historical and contemporary insect population abundance data. Insect populations can fluctuate wildly from year to year in the same region. Uh, the high variability in population trends in insects um, is often not the same when you compare species to species, especially in different orders. Um, we don't see the same trends necessarily in different regions. So there can be interregional variation. Uh, the same insect species in different habitats can respond differently. And there's some wonderful papers out there um, that, that kind of summarize the multiple drivers of insect population trends. It's a very complex uh, uh, group of interacting, kind of synergistically interacting factors that impact uh, population in insects. And all of this, of course, is being complicated by climate change, which essentially is moving the goalposts. So in Maine, what we have done is we've tried to pick groups of um, iconic insects that, that people would get behind and be enthusiastic about surveying so we can do our best uh, um, job at kind of establishing baseline data, which I now think we have firmly established for dragonflies, butterflies, and bumblebees in the state. I often get asked, well, you know, what can I do? And um, I, first of all, if you haven't seen this particular Netflix um, video, I highly recommend it. It really is worth seeing by Sir David Attenborough, who has basically documented the loss of the wild in his lifetime, in his 97 plus years. For property owners, I encourage you to get this book, Nature's Best Hope. Uh, Doug Tellamy talks about homegrown national park. Some really simple things, you know, reducing the size of your lawn, eliminating leaf removal, uh, hosting native plants as opposed to plants from other regions, especially in the fall, particularly important for fall pollinators and fall breeders who require that sustenance and so forth. Um, he talks about rewilding property and encouraging your neighborhood to do the same. And if I can just give you a, a quick study that was published last year, the results, the almost golf course green at King's College in Oxford, about three acres. And you can see the way that's normally mowed. Well, they decided not to mow about one acre for three years just to see what would happen. And after three years, they basically compared sample sites in the wild part and in the mown part. And what they found was this, three times as many plant species, three times as many insect species, three times as many spider species, 14 invertebrates of special conservation concern, 25 times more invertebrate biomass, three times more bat recordings, because of course the bats are hunting here where there's insects flying at night. And of course, reduced uh, carbon dioxide emission, emissions both in terms of not cutting the lawn and uh, um, providing more cover to the ground. Like it's a perfect example of the, if you build it, they will come scenario. For anybody wanting to, uh, do something more natural with their yards, 
I encourage you to go online to the Pollinator Partnership. These are the two free PDF files that cover our state regions, which will describe plants that, that uh, native plants that you can, can um, grow on your own property. I always, I always get asked for advice about butterfly guides. Um, ours is the only one that I've heard of for Maine and the Maritimes. For the East Coast, um, either of those books are fine. I think uh, Czech's book is now out of print, but you can still get Glassbird's book. Uh, for all of North America, um, either of those work. Uh, I like anything that I can put on my phone or my like iPad. Uh, so the, the Swift Guide uh, fits that that uh, designation. If you're interested in caterpillars, there are options out there also that are available. Um, I host several websites, including the Maine Butterfly site. So there's lots of information about Maine Butterflies on that. Uh, all you do is do Maine Butterfly Survey. You'll find it. Got a smartphone? I highly advise getting the Seek app. It's pretty good, and you might want to consult iNaturalist. Um, it's good. It's AI is not getting better and better at recognizing photos of species that you may take with your cell phone. And this photo is halfway decent. The other question I get asked frequently by those of you who have participated in other citizen science initiatives is, "What's next?" and we actually have a meeting next month to discuss it. I'm personally pushing for flower flies, a really important group of pollinators. The larvae of many of these species are also important predators. So it's a, it's a really important group. We have over 200 species known in the state of Maine, over 400 species known in the Northeast. There's an excellent field guide out in 2019 on this group. So I'm not saying flower flies is next, but that's what I'm going to be pushing for next month. The other question I get asked often time is, well, I want a book for all of insects. Well, I say, you know, it's, 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 um, there, there are maybe 2,100 species of birds north of the Mexican border in North America. Um, maybe less than that in in the lower 48 they're like and minimum estimate by AFW is like 20,000 species of insects in Maine alone there is no book that you can get single book that you can get as an insect guide but there are guides out there to insect families and a recent one that I like that came out last year by Abbott and Abbott is, is this one insects of North America you might get it. It's got a pictorial key uh, that kind of follows the big Marshall books instead of a dichotomous key with verbiage that actually uses pictures to kind of guide you through and give you some representatives. So it's a neat little book and also available in Kindle format. All right. Um, I have a bunch of thank yous. Uh, first of all, my co-authors, Philip de Maynardier, John Klimko, Herb Wilson, uh, John Calhoun, the inimitable Brian Pfeiffer, who did all of our photo editing for the book, including the cover, and uh, took many of the pictures that you see in the book. But more importantly, the 861 citizen scientists who actually collected the data for this project in both Maine and the Canadian Maritimes. They did most of the work. And as I always do, uh, several decades of my UMF research assistants that followed me through marshes and up the sides of mountains and across rivers and um, various places uh, surveying dragonflies and butterflies and grasshoppers and tiger beetles and so forth. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that might have arisen in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron Butler. Those pictures were absolutely beautiful. Um, I think that we what we'll do is there's some thank yous pouring in on the chat. We'll take one or two questions. And then, Ron, if it's okay with you, I may send a few more over email. And then we could answer those, um, send them out to participants. Does that work? And, and anybody who wants to get to me offline, my 
email address is in the lower right there. So feel free to email me and answer questions all the time. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Haley, uh, give us a couple questions. Yeah, so one of the earlier ones was, do butterfly and moth ecoregions match bird ecoregions? Um, I don't know. <laughs> and the reason I say I don't know is um, we, we've talked about this a number of different times. You know, in the book, um, I did a quick map of uh, using the... Um, Nature Conservancy's eco-regional scheme and the number of butterfly species that are in age. But no one has ever done a, a recent formal analysis with more recent eco-regional schemes to see if insects actually recognize them. Hmm. Um, and one might even ask, well, would aquatic insects like dragonflies and damselflies have the same kind of eco-regional sense that more terrestrial organisms like butterflies have? Or might there be differences based more on lake types than the region itself? We did find in studies we published in 2021 on bumblebees that there were some eco-regional differences in bumblebee assemblages, but they were minor uh, differences. The differences we saw in eco-regions in that study tended to be more with phenology. In other words, the, the life cycles of bees in that particular region, uh, uh, more than the, the types of bees. Where, where, is there, for example, a tendency for the, the uh, Bombus terricola, which was proposed for endangered species status and rejected, to be more prevalent uh, kind of in the northern mountain region than it is elsewhere in the state? Yeah, there is. Um, but we didn't find, uh, uh, the short answer is there has not been a rigid statistical analysis to ask insects if they agree with any of the eco-regional schemes that are out there. Okay. Um, the second question is, can pruning produce better forage for caterpillars? I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Basically, uh, primary growth, encouraging primary growth. new plant growth. Yeah, new, right. And and that, that I mean, that makes sense. I mean, the, 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 the metabolites tend to be sequestered at higher concentrations in more mature plant tissue. So that suggests that that might. Um, if it's done within the window that the butterfly species that you're concerned with actually breeds. Okay, we have a, we have a couple more questions, but I think Due to time, if it is okay, we will uh, include them in a follow-up email. Sure, sure, absolutely. Wonderful. And we'll also include a link to your book, uh, but, well, all of them, I think. Um, and, and we've gotten some wonderful feedback in the chat, so I'll make sure that gets to you. Just let me go back for just a yeah. second. Mm -hmm. If I can, oh, right here. If you guys copy this down, mm -hmm. 09BCARD, and if you want to get the book, don't go to Amazon. Mm. Go to Cornell University Press. That code will get you one third off. Okay. All right. I'm putting that I in the share chat. Share that as well. Everybody. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much um, again, Dr. Ron Butler. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this was a really, honestly, such a stunning way to end a very dreary evening here, at least here in Bath, Maine. Uh, so we really, really appreciate your time. Have a wonderful night, oh, my everyone. Pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thanks for having me.